Leaf Street in Penang Island, once known as the Hakka Millionaire's Row, hosted grand mansions that reflected the wealth and influence of their occupants. Most were affluent businesses and tradesmen during the late 19th and early 20th century, when Penang was a bustling port city. The streetscape has changed today, with only a small fraction of these mansions remaining. The most renowned property along this street is the Chongfatsi Mansion, named after the prominent merchant and businessman who built it in the late 1890s. The Chongfatsi Mansion, also known as the Blue Mansion because of the unique eye-catching indigo blue lime wash that covers its walls, is one of the earliest and most successful heritage restoration projects in Georgetown. We're standing in front of Chong Fat Si, the Blue Mansion. Chong Fat Si basically represented the rags to riches story of the early migrant Chinese to this country. Came at the age of 16, started off with nothing but the clothes on his back, and grew to become Consul General for China, Special Trade Commissioner for Southeast Asia, reporting to the Empress Dowager. He started banks, he started railways. He was, he was called China's lost Mandarin and first capitalist. And here in Penang, he built his most beautiful of his properties to house the most favoured of his wives, his seventh wife. It covers an area of 55,000 square feet, which is about 5,000 square metres. The built-up area itself is more than 3,000 square metres and originally it had maids' quarters, it had stables for horses and carriages. If you can visualise horses and carriages coming up along the side driveway, coming to the front here, picking up Chong Fat Si and then going out through the Chinese gateway. It was in the family until 1989 when that last son passed away. Problem was there wasn't enough money left specifically to look after this house. I like to call it an act of faith that uh, we took this on with the intention at that point in time just of saving the house. We were also duty bound to have to show Penang and Penang people and the government at that point in time that conservation was not something that was just a little hobby that people who had nothing better to do and were willing to invest money wanted to do. It was something that could pay for itself, that conservation could be a very profitable venture. This would have been where Chong Fat Si would have run both the Consul Generalship of China as well as his business practices. It's very formal, it's very male. This is where the men talk shop. And this would be the central courtyard. It's the largest of the five courtyards that we have. There are two on that side, two on the other side. This one is the most dramatic, the most stunning of the courtyards. And the four corners, you will find cast iron columns from Glasgow. These would have been ordered, manufactured in Scotland, brought over an East India Company ships that put in place. The centre has what we call the chi point, the point of strongest energy and the most important for feng shui practitioners. The entire house, in fact, has been built on feng shui principles and, and they are best demonstrated in this stunning courtyard. Above us, we have rainfall, sunshine, air. These are called gifts of nature. And you must never close your courtyard because gifts of nature are brought down to be used by inhabitants of the house and to give some, some, some glow to the men and women living in this house. For the Chinese, the best feng shui position and certainly for Chong Fat Si would have been to face the sea, not difficult on an island, to have hills behind for protection, which it has, and to sit on what we call an incline. In Chinese, it's translated as to sit off the dragon's back. I've often been asked, uh, what's my favourite part of the house? Or what's the most important part of the house? And my answer has always been right here. It's called the qi point, the energy vortex of the house. 
The house originally was perfectly symmetrical from this point. And of course, we've had a lot of uh, feng shui conferences and feng shui masters who have visited and uh, they all swear that this is an incredible pointer. To the rear, you see what would originally have been the ancestral hall where the tablets, the ancestral tablets for Chong Fat Si would have been placed. We have actually retained everything as we found it, except for the ancestral tablets. Today, it's used as a breakfast area for the hotel. We're currently in the right wing corridor. The main house was actually constructed first. And over a space of about six years, the wings were added on. And there are very clear architectural indications that these were later additions. And in fact, there are many parts of the house where you cannot access the main house from the wing, except through the rear actually. So basically, as the family grew, the house expanded. And oral history tells us that as you lost favour, you got, kind of got pushed up to the wings and the more favoured current, you know, favourites were in the centre of the house. The centre actually has eight large rooms. Now we have nine rooms for the hotel on this side and nine on the other corridor. We have retained all original features, meaning that um, the five courtyards, which are granite-based, have all been retained. And what you see here as what look like pools are done in the most recommended conservation fashion, which is what we call reversible interventions. If you actually need to do something, make sure that you can reverse it. So we did not remove the, the granite slabs. We did not uh, cement or, or do anything you know, drastic to the courtyards. In fact, we've retained everything as original. We have added silicon, basically containers. And these can be removed tomorrow. And the original courtyard with and the original cops are all still there. Nothing has been touched. So this is the conservation process that we advocate. That there are many, many things which are needed in uh, the current Build Back Better. But make sure you can take it away if it's something as important as a granite courtyard. We're now in uh, the lounge bar. This, in the past, would have been one of the eight main bedrooms uh, of the big house. Here you see some of the most stunning you know, uh, architectural features of the house. If you look below us, there are, these tiles are from Stoke-on-Trent, from England. They are called encaustic tiles, which are very special Stoke-on-Trent tiles. If you look closely, each piece in the tile is actually a different coloured clay pushed into a form and then the entire thing is fired rather than a normal tile which would have been painted and then fired. Here we also see an example of the stained glass windows of which we have 48 panels. And they're Art Nouveau stained glass and as you can well imagine, there wasn't a single piece of the 48 panels which was undamaged by the time we found it. Broken glass, twisted frames. We were very lucky in that we actually managed to find a Penang stained glass restorer who had lived many years in Germany. We are now in what would originally have been family living room, where women would have sewn, played mahjong, whatever that women did in those days. To this side, we call it the left of the house because when you refer to left and right, you're actually facing out. The left is always the male side, and this was Chong Fat Si's bedroom. Today, this is uh, Indigo, a fine dining restaurant. On this side is the servery, and on this side is private dining. Here on this balcony on the first floor, you will see 12 panels of what have been assessed as among the finest and the most delicate of this work, this Qian Nian work. Qian Nian basically is porcelain cut and paste. It is a Tochu and Hokkien art form where bowls, rice bowls basically, are used. They're actually manufactured specifically for this work. They're made as thin as possible 
the uh, inside is actually not glazed so that there's actually better adhesion when you use them. The artisan basically gets a pail, a box, a basket, fills them with bowls. There are seven basic colours. He goes up to the rooftops or to the balcony and he uses a pair of pliers and he chen or he chips the bowls in tiny little pieces and then he fixes it with a lime putty and makes these incredible displays of, of birds and flowers and men and women. Um, the 12 panels here, as I mentioned, have been assessed as among the finest of this kind of Chen Yan work. And they depict various uh, gods, gods of war, god of studies, gods of gambling, god of food, different uh, stories from mythology. And uh, we actually had to bring in from China almost 10,000 of these bowls. All the artisans from China as well, because nobody here can actually remember how to do them properly. And we have seen quite sad examples in town of people replacing Chen Nian with uh, bathroom mosaic tiles, you know, etc. Because basically the skill is lost. When we said there was nothing in place to help conservation, this was one of the areas where we struggled. They wanted to levy a, a foreign crockery tax. Meaning if you brought in crockery from Australia or England or whatever, you have to pay a foreign crockery tax. But we said, but we are going to break up these bowls. And basically the response is, we don't care what you're going to do with these bowls. This is foreign crockery, you pay a foreign crockery tax. So, you know, we all kind of quite clever. The next round of crockery we brought in, we broke the bowls first. Chong Fatsi actually caught pneumonia, died in Indonesia in Batavia, today known as Jakarta, of course. Buried back in China where the family house still is, in Taipu. Architecturally, there are apparently only two houses of this architectural size and style outside of China. Five courtyard houses. The other one is in Medan, Sumatra. Architecturally, again, the most interesting difference between the two houses is while this one is very Chinese-English, the other one in Sumatra is very Chinese-Dutch. And the differences are actually quite lovely to look at. We are at the entrance of one of the two in-house museums at the mansion. And basically the exhibits involve the things that were found in the house upon the purchase. Unfortunately, the trustees of Chong Fatsi conducted an auction prior to the sale of the mansion. What you see here in the two museums are basically what they saw no value in. Old clothes, old photographs, which of course to us were invaluable. We've tried to put it all together so that there is a storyline. Keeping, retaining this house and restoring this house and keeping the myths, the stories, the legends, the, the mystery of something like this is totally invaluable that people can come, any of you can come today and experience it. To me, this is immeasurable. Thank you for being with us and we hope you've enjoyed this.